I think one thing that has always intrigued me and, and, and I think is sort of highlighted by what you're saying, Kate, is, is also the need for maintaining some of the traditional skills. So, for example, um, an area that I've always noted and, and tried to support is, you know, things like um, our understanding of botany and, and plant taxonomy and those, those sort of basic skills that we need. After all, Parvez was talking about needing ichthyologists, people who've got those fundamental skills, which mm -hmm. aren't, aren't very fashionable at the moment. But if we lose them, we're going to be in difficulty later on in, t in terms of identifying, for example, additional new novel natural resources and so on. Mm -hmm. how, how, can you cast some light on how that fits in with your model. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's there, isn't it, in terms of the model, we're talking about some of those new technologies and new, new modalities. But it, if we talk about basic, you know, sort of plant biology, we talk there about developing vaccines within plants. So you can't, you can't do that. You can't if you haven't got if you haven't got some of the basics, I think. Um, if you look at some of the programs that, that we're, we're running, you're learning those basic scientific skills alongside working within these high tech businesses. Um, so you can't develop cell and gene therapies if you haven't got an understanding of genetics. You can't develop uh, new modalities uh, in sustainable meats if you don't know how bioprocessing works. So you absolutely need those fundamental skills. Um, I think it's thinking about how do those how do you apply those fundamental skills? I think sometimes we, we teach them. Um, uh, I think, as Hepty was saying, uh, sort of subject by subject uh, and not necessarily the application of it. So thinking about that plant biology and how could you use plants to develop new vaccines? You know, those are the sorts of things that really look at the perhaps the new applications of the basic biology. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree entirely. Thank you very much. Um, we've got, as I say, we've got some questions that are appearing in the Q&A. So do, do keep posting questions and we'll keep hopefully answering them. Um, if I can just read them off here. So first of all, um, this is one directly focused for you, Hefsi, but <laughs> um, how do you see interdisciplinary natural science degrees contributing to the future picture? Yes, so I think they're quite vital and uh, we do need a lot more integrated um, degrees. So I remember when I started my biomedical science degree in that first year, we had the option of pick, to pick other things. And um, I picked in French and realized I'm terrible at French. So go do languages and then you get rid of that. But if, so bringing that to the natural, natural sciences, if we can circulate almost during the first year, um, a bit of your geography and a bit of the um, sort of biology itself and a little bit of physiology and if you circulate around all those different sciences then perhaps when you then get to the third year where some of the inter, inter, in, intercalated that word you then have to specialize if we're linking that back to specialty in a particular area you are you are making an informed decision you haven't just um decided um 16 to an extent or 17 or 18 i'm going to university to, to do this science degree without appreciating the other arms that could be considered a subset or aspects of this particular degree as well. And then if you then decide to specialize in something else, at least you've got a taste of everything else which can feed into the workplace in the future um, in that multidisciplinary context. Thank you, that's great. Um, there's, a, there's a question, it, it, it says for Kate, but I think actually, again, it, it's, it, it's a more general question that I think is focused on everybody, which is, talking about encouraging people from other fields to come into science roles, but also how do we retain science graduates to stay in the sector? Because many see opportunities in other sectors and we lose their skills from the science workforce. And I guess in particular, um, engineers and data and computational scientists um, can potentially earn quite a lot more in other sectors. So how, how do we retain them within the biosciences? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a there's a couple of pieces to that. I mean, in part of me thinks that actually I do. I want more scientists in other sectors. Uh, so an example for me would be more scientists in the civil service would be amazing. Um, and then when we when we talk about pandemic preparedness within the, within the civil service, then we've got people who can you know talk about science. So I would like to see more scientists in other sectors. Uh, in terms of being able to retain uh, more scientists and bioscientists uh, within 
uh, within biology. Um, I think we need to talk about the opportunities that there are. Um, I don't think people um, thoroughly understand all the different sorts of careers that you can go into. I certainly didn't. I did a degree in genetics. Um, and then I went into biochemical engineering um, and, you know, I've, I've spent my, my career kind of combining the two. Um, I don't think we uh, really give the uh, give the undergraduates uh, and, and the graduate opportunities to to look at all of those different career opportunities that are out there. Um, I think there is so much, there's almost too much. Um, and I, I don't think that we see, you know, what are the sort of opportunities and, and perhaps even, uh, you know, we've been doing a bit of research into industry placements. It's really, you know, it's really difficult to get into industry placements and it's, it's really difficult to encourage employers. But actually, you know, my industry placement, okay, it was 20 years ago, so it's a long time, but that's what encouraged me to, to move into the pharmaceutical sector. Um, so getting more of that experience within within the workplace and understanding the sorts of things that are available, uh, I think would help retain them within the sector. But that's only my view. I mean, it's, it's said for me, but I think you know, Hepsi and Farmers can can answer as well. <laughs> I was going to say, could it we either either Hepsi want to come in on there? I'm happy to. I was typing that. I was going to say people would always be fluid, and so what we talk about well whichever way people are moving from the sciences to other sectors or other sectors to the sciences. Um, they see graduates said yesterday move into management, so they're not doing the hardcore science on the ground anyway. And over time, you sort of get these skills with those technical skills because you now focus on management and getting more funding into your, your labs and your organizations. And so you, you don't feel the pipeline when you graduate who perhaps are around for about three, five years and a proportion might decide and I want to go into the police force, for example. But if we can, I suppose, focus more on CPDs for current workforce so they can have those skills that perhaps are transferable to other sectors and vice versa for the other sectors and re remove the um, almost pre-entry requirements to some of these um, short courses that if someone were in... Um, well, I lost my train of thought now. If someone wants to do like, a, I don't want to use chemistry, I want a non-science qualification. Someone did history, for example, working in the city, and then decide, actually, I quite want to, I quite like to go do science. And um, there was some kind of a short induction course that they can be put into specifically for the schools that they may require for that science role that they now want to um, shift into. There should be accommodation for that because, I mean, as, as an adult working in the city, I'm sure your brain can assimilate some um, basic biology that you can then support the workplace with, with the, a lot of the tech that come along with some of these jobs as well now. Um, you have to almost retrain on a yearly basis with some of these sectors. So I personally don't see why uh, people will keep moving, whether for geographical locations or just life happening or changing their priorities as to how they want to spend their, their time in the workplace. And we need to be more flexible how we feed in that continuous pipeline. It's all I'm trying to say, I think. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> Pavez, have you got any comments about that? Um, I, I would say, you know, the, the number one fundamental would be make it fun. Uh, make them love the subject. If you can make the students love the subject and they, they have a great experience at university or, or at high school, um, then more than likely they will want to uh, continue along those lines. Um, there's so much that comes down to uh, how things are taught. Uh, the teacher as well, um, or the lecturer, they can have a huge impact on, uh, and I know a lot of my own students have said, yeah, you know, it's like, uh, I didn't pursue this because I didn't like the teacher. Uh, and it can be as simple as that. So, you know, I think uh, the important thing is that, you know, we hire uh people who have like uh something to give the students that will you know that will keep them engaged interested uh and and most importantly happy actually it's like um yeah those are i think that's the the, the fundamental really isn't it <laughs> i think so is it probably true I'm, I'm sure it's true for all of us is is yeah but we've been in the areas that we're in because we've loved them and mm -hmm. found them really interesting Exactly. And yeah, in, enjoyed them as well. I think that's, that's great. Thank you. And I think that sort of leads on actually nicely to the next, another general question, which is, has the public perception of biology degrees and what biology graduates are capable of kept up with their evolving reality? And how can we confidently promote those degrees and the skills they already include? 
because often, I mean, I know when I've done outreach programs in schools, there's often quite an old fashioned view of what biology is all about. And the really scary one is, is that it's biology is the science for scientists who can't do maths. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> There's a lot of computational biology. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think we've 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 had quite an opportunity at the moment. Um, I think if we think about the opportunities for how biology can solve some of the big problems in the world right now, whether it be climate change, whether it be pandemic, you know, whatever it whatever it is, I think we've got real opportunities to think about how how we sell biology. Um, in terms of what sort of problems can it solve? If you're passionate about climate change, you know biology can you know be the subject that that you you uh, that you study, uh, and there are ways of being able to solve these big problems through biology. So I think it's it's almost a marketing campaign, isn't it? In terms of you know what does what does biology do? Well, it solves all these big problems. If you're passionate about that, then uh, this is the way the way to study it. And those challenges have changed, haven't they? They changed from you know 20 25 years ago when I when I studied. Uh, genetics at, at Leicester DNA fingerprinting was just coming out and now we're you know we can do all sorts of amazing things so we need to change that marketing uh, but I, I think we need to get that you know really into schools and, and teachers aren't necessarily getting that sort of information. Any other thoughts? Pavez or Hefsi? Always got something to say. We have no two. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> uh, as to the, two, the two angles I was going to take. Um, so first with the, the comments with the math and the biology and everything else, I think the curriculum, science curriculum that was updated in 2016 has actually factored in, I think 10% of math needs to be in um, all questions, at least for GCSEs across physics, chemistry and biology. Um, and usually um, students are doing a biology paper and you're thinking, well, what, where's, where's from the math? And so you have to keep reminding them, well, it's collectively, um, there is math and science. So yeah, let's <laughs> get used to that. And the other thing was from the communicating um, community engagement side of things. Um, as I did mention in my talk, is trying to think as um, when, when you're designing outreach programs, and outreach projects, how can you design those activities so that perhaps it can help shift some of the traditional perspectives on what biology is? And so I know the RSV have Biology Week as an example, and they do, and, and I'm, I'm, I am a biologist campaign, and I did wonder um, actually how many people often engage with, I know it's usually on Twitter, but it, it's a good opportunity perhaps to jump off of that back of that as, as an example of a campaign, just to showcase all of the, how biology has been involved in the different um, researchers in the workplace who consider themselves a biologist who are not necessarily working in traditional perceived biology roles and feed that down into community engagement. So over time, everyone gets the message. Excellent. Actually, uh, I, I think that, um... I lived in Finland for I think it was 13 or so years. Uh, both my kids went to high school there, and uh, I think uh, you know there is an issue when it comes to how things are taught. So I don't think uh, biologists are actually intrinsically bad at maths. Uh, I think maybe they're just not being taught maths in the right way, uh, given their interest areas. So uh, at least in Finland, when my kids were taught maths, you know, through biology, it was very very applied. And that seemed to have a massive difference on how they actually, you know, felt about maths as a subject in general. Um, so I think, again, it's kind of going back to, uh, you know, how things are taught uh, to, to the youngsters, isn't it? So. I think that, that gives me a really nice segue into two of the next questions <laughs> about how things are taught. Um, the first one is... Um, Oops, sorry, it's just where where can a life scientist go to develop their own interdisciplinary skill sets? If if they've been through this the siloed education system, as the question writer has put, how and they now work in one of those silos, how can they then broaden out? Because the the, the danger is that you're sort of almost seen as taking a step back. I think it depends where you start. If you're young, then internships are a good place. You can do free internships for all sorts of companies and uh, all sorts of academics. You know, a lot of people will accept you. Uh, 
uh, if you're an enthusiastic enough. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be a paid internship. You can also go and work with other people in different countries uh, and you can do MOOCs. So the massive uh, open online courses like edX and so forth. Uh, you can, if you have an interest in something, you can actually go, uh, go and learn something specific uh, on edX and get a certificate uh, as a CPD certificate and uh, yeah, develop your skills like that. Um, that would be my take on, on how you can sort of move across uh, mm -hmm. boundaries and uh, enter different disciplines. Yeah, there's so much free content now. There's so much. Uh, there's almost there's almost too much, and some of it needs to be frame quality controlled. But there's there is there's an awful lot of free content. I think it's up to you to go and do it. No one's going to give it to you. So if you've got uh, you know you want to go and explore something, go and explore it. Uh, go and see what's out there. Um, I went into into my secondary school uh, yesterday, and we talked about data science and bioinformatics. And there's so much free like open source stuff out there that people can just go and learn and play and fiddle. Um, and if you're interested, you'll do it. If you're not interested, then you have a little play and it's like, well, that's definitely not the route for me. I think that's equally as valuable too. But there's such a lot of free stuff out there. Um, and there's also, you know, there's some really great uh, post-grad programs that are in that interdisciplinary space. Um, and there's also a number of um, apprenticeships at that sort of level six and level seven that mean that you can be taken on by a company in an area that perhaps you are moving into. So one of the ones that, that we uh, particularly work with is things like regulatory affairs. No one necessarily does an undergraduate program in, in regulatory affairs. It's not something you choose from school, um, but actually as a, a master's level apprenticeship, uh, you know, you've got a lot of that sort of biological sciences type of background going into a regulatory type field and apprenticeship means that you are studying for that qualification and doing four days a week within the business or 80% of your time. So there are things like apprenticeships, which uh, are suitable for any age as well. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> again, that's a, it's a really insightful answer. And related to the sort of education theme, um, here's another question about how, how do we go about teaching critical skills in the areas of biosciences and how can we improve the way that that's done because again that's a really important aspect of the broader education not just for people who are going to stay in the biosciences but if we're going to move into other sectors as well um i was going to say the sometimes universities often have outsourced and type consultancy services that usually postgraduate um are into to take part in so if there was a way that um other organizations could if they do have these sort of systems short consultancy type projects that others can use the opportunity to temporarily branch out into taking part in those projects we can learn the skills through the experience and practice that way i think it's one way Thank you. I think a lot of critical skills ultimately boil down to uh, philosophical skills, like critical thinking, critical analysis. And, um, you know, I think uh, philosophy isn't actually taught in any great depth or detail in school or university. Um, and perhaps, you know, bringing back philosophical elements into, you know, at least at the school level, uh, would already help uh, uh, youngsters to uh, develop critical skills more effectively kate have you got any observations about critical skills um yes <laughs> um <laughs> so uh the introduction of things like the new t levels uh in health and science so um and the apprenticeships at, at levels three four and and five all have critical skills in them uh, critical skills that need to be developed in terms of the academic content towards a qualification, uh, but also in terms of their ability to uh, do those that critical thinking within the workplace. So employers really value those critical skills. Um, and so they've built those into those new programmes. I think I would I would like to see those being built on in undergraduate degree programmes as we, as we go through. Um, and I think, as Hepsi said, you know, those employer set projects and thinking about some of those big problems um, it probably links to some of the other questions about how do we attract uh, graduates into, you know, undergraduates into bioscience, thinking about those big problems, thinking about those big problems that they're really passionate about. You know, those are those are how you develop those sort of critical skills. 
Thank you. And again, sort of closely related to something that you've all been talking about, which is um, we've, we've seen the need for bioscience jobs, we've seen the need for developing the bioscience skills, but how do we feel that industry should be more effective in influencing the curriculum? Because universities engage with industries at different levels, but how in, do they have enough traction, if you like, with the undergraduate curricula? So it's a half and half question in one sense, isn't it? Uh, because uh, on the one hand, you want to you want to have industry engagement so that you can sort of uh, enable uh, a pathway for students to get into industry. But like you said earlier, we also need to keep the really important like uh, fundamental skills in taxonomy and uh, all these fu fundamental biological skills that if you lose them, you lose a huge chunk of knowledge. Um, so I, I think oftentimes we do end up uh, leaning much towards industry because that's where the jobs are, that's where the money is. But uh, at the end of the day, we do need, you know, on, on the other side of the coin, we need to uh, keep and retain uh, a lot of these fundamental skills. Otherwise, uh, yeah, it's not going to look good for the future. I'd say. <laughs> We, we need the industry of the future too. You know, it's all very well engaging with industry now, but we need to um, be engaging with uh, bioscience undergrads about entrepreneurialism and developing those ideas and building their own companies. Um, so I would say that's something that, that we need to think about more is that building the industry of the future uh, rather than going into a job that's already established. How do you build your own company? Uh, how do you develop your own idea? How do you you know, build your organisation. I think that's that's quite a, an exciting piece that perhaps we don't promote quite as much. And I know when I was at um, Queen Mary, as part of the PhD programme, you could take part in um, bioscience entrepreneurship type um, projects with industry links, and you get to win some money, which is always the same thing as a PhD student. Uh, but I don't know how widespread that practice is across um, the various institutions or even filtering down to sit form and yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's not uh, at PhD level, it probably, you know, it's probably fairly widespread. I think, it, you know, at the certainly the, the school and the college and then the, even the undergrad level, do, do undergrad bioscience know that they can build their own company? I don't know. I think it's very interesting. I mean, <clears throat> as an accreditor within for the RSB, what, one of the questions that is now on the sort of listing that, that we look at when we're looking at programmes is the whether entrepreneurism is built within, to the, pro, within the programmes that the students are studying. So it's, it, it is starting to become a focus, but it, I, think, I guess it's an area that we should be looking at more deeply as we go forward. Um, another question that's come in um, is, we, we've, we've touched on it in some of the questions, but thinking about keeping ourselves up to date, how can we use interdisciplinary approaches to keep ourselves up to date, especially with the new technologies that probably weren't even around when we graduated? I mean, we should be all doing that anyway, shouldn't we? That's part of our CPD. So we're not really sure. I'm not really sure I can answer that one uh, with, without saying that we, we should all be up to date. You're right. That, I mean, like I said, I was in school uh, yesterday and we were talking about bioinformatics. That didn't exist when I was at school. Um, but I can go in and talk about bioinformatics and talk about jobs in bioinformatics and take bioinformaticians in and they can talk. So um, we should all be keeping ourselves up to date with our CPD anyway. I agree, but I, I think, I mean, when I've talked with teachers and run teachers, courses for teachers is they feel they've got so much on their plate already and that trying to keep up to date with new developments within the subject when they're dealing with everything else is, is actually a real challenge for them. So I think I think it's it, it is it is difficult, particularly less so perhaps at university, but I, I certainly think it's a, it's a challenge for teachers. Mm -hmm. Hefsi, you, from, from your insights, where do I'll, you stand I'll on this? Say, um, taking it from a communication side of things again, in that people are busy and there's so much information out there and it's almost trying to filter out 
um, the three top priorities that you may have want to um, be abreast with the latest tech, with the latest um, data analytical softwares, with the latest um, in the pharmaceutical industry research side of things. But then if you have one hour of downtime once a week in the evening, how realistically do you fit that in and how do you decide what you're going to fit in? So if, um, I know this usually goes on YouTube, but then if you're not plugged into the RSB intentionally, you might miss it. And if perhaps there's scope to um, jump on uh, some of these short time video snippets that engage people on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, um, I don't have TikTok, by the way, it's very time wasting. Um, some of these other outlets, a lot of people say they don't have time, but do have time for to just get the hook in and perhaps over time may plug in more actively if you keep seeing useful new information for, from a particular feed that you keep coming across. Um, I think it's one way because there's so much information out there and even I struggle to keep abreast of what everyone else is doing and yeah. I think it comes a lot of it comes down to policy, actually, uh, company policy or uh, the policy of the HEI that you might be working at. I think, you know, at the end of the day, there has to be a policy within either a company or, or whatever it is uh, that allows uh, workers or anybody who's hired to get CPD for a week or two weeks per year. Uh, I don't think that is uh, commonplace uh, in most companies. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, I think it should be commonplace because it's also, I mean, it's good for the company if, uh, if uh, their workers upgrade their skills to CPD. Uh, but if you don't give them the time, since you mentioned that it's just, you know, people are overwhelmed and overworked, give them the time. I know it costs a bit of money, but you actually get better people at the end of it, right? I couldn't agree more, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so again, a, a theme that's coming through, and I think we've probably, as educators, we're all aware of, is the focus on um, teaching and learning to the test. So students are focused on getting high grades and sort of doing what, what needs to be done to get those grades rather than developing the broader set of skills. So how do, how do we... This is a really big question, actually, for educators. How, how do we move the goalposts to focus more on developing skills and less on teaching to the test and learning to the test? A lot of universities here in Australia, I'm not sure if it's even all of them, from the third year on for undergraduate courses, uh, are, they don't have examinations. Uh, a lot of them are uh, mo uh, primarily project-based. I think that's a very good way of uh, dealing with this problem. Um, I actually think examinations could be uh, removed altogether, to be honest with you, because a lot of students might take an exam, they might have memorized something in a parrot-like fashion, but then after the exam, they don't care about what, uh, what it is that they learned. Uh, if, they, if you want them to care about what they learned, you need to get them to apply it in some way. You need to make them understand, it, understand its use in a broader context and that's typically achievable through project work uh, rather than through here's a bunch of questions that you need to answer memorize this book and good luck on uh, the 23rd of may or whenever the exams can be <laughs> Effie or kate have you got any thoughts on that um is this exams at all levels, so university level? I, I mean, for the GCC A levels, um, a level, not everyone chooses to do A levels, but I think that there, there is a benefit to skills you can gain from taking exams, especially at a young age, because um, children are very buzzy and creative and focusing and having a discipline to stick to working towards a target is perhaps a skill that I feel is best learned at a young age through examination. That's, I'm thinking one benefit of examination, um, at least for GCSEs, um, because ad otherwise you, you're going through school, learning different things. A lot of the time they're engaged because of the way things are structured anyway, and it's a case of what's the point. But for the few who perhaps want to get that um, compulsory math and English GCSEs, there is an element to 
being disciplined and sticking at that thing because there was an examination at the end. So although everyone was set up in year 11, anyway, three months to the exam, but at least you go through a process of learning to be organized, learning to work to a timetable and learning to almost read and assimilate information that you can pass on to a third party who is the piece of paper in this in this case as an examination. But um I think it's a it's a combination, isn't it? I think there are some advantages to being focused and having to, you know, put that discipline into answering questions. But there, um, you know, are all of those examinations accessible to everybody, uh, and are we testing the right things? Uh, and is the weighting right for those examinations? I think um, if I uh, think about the the apprenticeship programs, um, you know the there's an exam element to the, to the degree element of, of the apprenticeship, but then the apprenticeship itself is tested through um, a project and a presentation, uh, a technical presentation uh, of that uh, of that uh, project that they've done. Um, they get uh, sort of they, they have to present that in a professional to a professional audience and they get technical questions. Um, so that's a lot more applicable to how we would, uh, you know, how we would. Uh, test and how we would challenge some of that scientific content um, and then they get more of a viva kind of approach and this is at sort of level five and level six so they get you know a, a vocational competency discussion so being asked questions about you know some of their experiences and how they have uh, how they have responded to you know working as a team or being challenged in in a different situation so I think I think the examination is one approach uh, but I think we need to balance that with other approaches that, that make it more applicable to how we're actually going to be um, examined in real life. <laughs> I, I agree entirely. And I think it, it is perhaps one of the positives that's come out of the different way in which we've had to work um, as a result of the pandemic, which is that the standard um, scenario of 100 students all sitting down in an exam hall and writing three essays in three hours has changed for many of us and, and more authentic approaches of assessment, whilst in some ways challenging for the assessors are also actually really beneficial for getting students to think in different ways. So I, I think if we, if we can hang on to some of the benefits, so to speak from COVID, <laughs> then, then I think that that's certainly one of them to pick up on. Um, I know we're um, running close to the end of time, uh, but just a, a forward look. This is a question um, from one of the attendees. What are the subdisciplines of biology that might that are going to emerge for 2030? And how do we develop our workforce to do that? A really challenging forward look there. 2030 is not that far away. No. <laughs> 2030 is not that far away at all. I mean, you know, if, if I think about some of the new therapies and some of the, the new technologies, uh, I, I think we need to be teaching the cutting edge now for, for 2030. So if I think about the skills that, that we need, they're, they're not necessarily that different. Um, I, I, I think that uh, it's probably more of a question about sort of 2040, 2050, because 2030 is not that far away. Uh, but definitely thinking about the interdisciplinary, definitely thinking about the computational side of biology, but without losing some of that real fundamentals um, and thinking about some of those, you know, those new technologies that that we put forward, thinking about how how are we going to address some of those really big challenges. But it isn't that far away. No, it's scary. Isn't it? <laughs> we'll, definitely, yeah. we'll definitely get better at uh, handling big data, I think. I think that's one of the big challenges and uh, yeah, it's clear that a lot of biologists are actually very interested in in learning to program and, and learning um, aligned skills that can can help them in, you know, with, with respect to their own skills that they have uh, in the biosciences. And uh, I think programming is one of those that's, you know, in, in some way similar to I shouldn't use the curse word, but maths, uh, but that, you know, it is one of those skills that's universal uh for pretty much every discipline you can think of uh there, there's some place where you could use uh, a programmer and i think you know as uh, more and more biologists are going to be gaining these skills in programming and handling big data and, and so forth i think that's 2030 they will be able to handle big data better 
I can I can hear myself again plugging RSB accreditation here because again <laughs> big data is one of the things that <laughs> we, we talk about with universities that are going in for accreditation how, okay, how they're handling go. big data and how students are being introduced to dealing with it so brilliant I, so I everybody's agree. on the same wavelength then <laughs> that's a good sign <laughs> Essie do you want the final word on this one no, this one actually, I think I can't beat big data. So yeah, <laughs> I'll leave it there. Okay, I think we've covered all of the um, key questions, except perhaps, yeah, there is, is one here that is a significant one that I'd like to finish off with is, is how do we deal with EDI issues around getting students to work in teams? So that they they can build the skill sets that they need. It's a difficult uh, one. Yeah, Hesse. Getting students to work in teams. I, I think um, at the undergrad and postgraduate level, there are a lot of team work based projects that you get assessed on based on the presentation and allocation of tasks and who's doing what. Um, filtering down to a level in GCSEs as well, obsessively with the required practicals that students often have to do, they are usually doing those in um, small groups or in teams as well. But whether or not, if the focus is on the practical and not so much how you're working with different um, personalities within a particular project that you may be working on, then I suppose the take the takeaway from those students may be different. So it may come back down to the packaging of the tax that's been set and what information has been passed on to the students as to what we expect of you to be taking away from um, this required practical you're engaging in um, at the GCCA level um, stage and at university, um, I think we are a bit more mature and um, more driven at that point, at that stage in terms of how you delegate tasks in the team. And yeah, I'm not sure if that's answered the question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer the question? To some extent, yeah, I think it... I think sometimes you've got to look past differences. You just got to learn to look past differences. There's nothing wrong with. In fact, differences are a good thing. Um, but what you can do is you can just uh, focus on the problem at hand as a group and recognize that everybody here is just a brain. If you just look at it in the you know in in, in the simplest possible context, you're all brains contributing to this same mission. And your, you know, your end goal is the same end goal. Uh, you know, if you can kind of push that attitude, then I think uh, students end up seeing more similarities between themselves than they do uh, differences anyway. That's a great answer. Thanks, Parvez. Kate, 30 seconds. Oh, 30 seconds. Um, I think it's, yeah, embracing everybody's differences. Uh, everyone's got a, a, because we're all different, we've got a, a different viewpoint to, to contribute to. It's how we get great innovation. Uh, the more diverse our, our thinking, uh, the more innovation that, that we will we will have. Um, and so it's embracing everyone's differences um, and making sure that you can all contribute to that team. Thank you very much. So I'm conscious that, amazingly, we've run out of time already. I think it's been a great debate, great set of discussions, and we've had a really interesting set of questions posed. So thank you very much to three speakers for your different concepts, Parvez, Hesse, and Kate. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much also to the RSB team in the, in the background, so to speak, <laughs> um, who've been helping put this together, in particular, um, Harriet Makara, Ellie Barron and Laura Marshall, who've been running this series and helping putting this program together. And of course, thank you very much to everybody who has attended this evening. I hope you found it interesting. This and the other um, late events are all available on the RSB YouTube stream. So you can catch up with some of the other discussions. So for example, like climate change and so on, which was a previous one, which was also a really interesting debate. So I hope you'll make use of that. Thank you very much for your attention this evening and I hope you have a good rest of the evening. Thank you.